Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in the poem Salute Amand and we are in passages 11 and 12. Um, we sometimes will refer to this as the you passages because uh, 78 different times we will have the word you referenced so that's going to make it kind of interesting. Also, notice how many exclamation marks there are. We're going to have 19 of them of the enthusiasm, the exuberance is building towards the conclusion of, of passage 13. And we've seen this before, of course, elsewhere. We obviously saw it at the, um, uh, at, at, at the uh, end of the inscriptions uh, section. Uh, we're, we're starting from Pominock. We saw it. I mean, it's happened several times that we've seen this use of the exclamation point for, uh, for excitement. Now, the assumption is that you've been with us throughout our study of Leaves of Grass, beginning with those introductory comments, all of it archived there at learnstrong.net down the left-hand side, the Talks with Walt playlist. And my hope is that you've been with us from the very beginning up into and including the uh, passages of um, uh, uh, through, through number 10 of Salutable. The background here, uh, all, all that we need to say is that we're going to see more of this cataloging. Now, as we've already said, Whitman was fascinated by geography and looking at a globe. And he's looked at a number of places, and now he's going to look specifically at individuals that are there. So we're going to have right away, you, whoever you are. Now, you're going to remember this from our study of Song of Myself, Passage 47. You're going to remember the same language from Pent Up uh, Aching Rivers. And uh, One Hour to Madness, uh, we're going to have seen this a number of times before. One of the things that makes Whitman so remarkable is his desire to be very intimate, to just kind of almost reach out from the pages and speak directly to you, the reader, and obviously all of us as uh, collective readers. And he'll begin now by pointing out, again, habitants of different nations. You, daughter or son of England, you of the mighty Slavic tribes and empires, you Russ in Russia, you dim descended black, divine souled African, large, fine headed, nobly formed, superbly destined, on equal terms with me. Now go back to I Sing the Body Electric Passage 7, and we had some comments setting up this very kind of observation. Notice that Whitman, during a time when people owned other people as slaves, will in fact make the, the observation, there are no distinctions to be drawn, all on equal terms with me, exclamation point. There are a lot of people who are readers of, the, of his day, who had serious problems. Of course, the abolitionists always wanted to claim Whitman as part of their camp for a set of lines like this. He continues, you Norwegian, Swede, Dane, Icelander, you're Prussian, you Spaniard of Spain, you Portuguese, you French woman and Frenchman of France. Remember, he loves the French, obviously, Salutamon is a, is a reference directly to that. You Belge, you liberty lover of the Netherlands, and then he'll even tell us in parenthetics, you stock, once I myself have descended, this idea of stock, go back to what we said at the very beginning of Song of Myself, passage one, the idea of, he was always aware of who he came from, right? You sturdy Austrian, you Lombard, Hun, Bohemian, uh, farmer of uh, Styria in southeast, uh, eastern Austria, you neighbor of the, of the Danube, you working man of the Rhine, uh, the Elbe, or the Weiser, obviously Germany, you working woman too. The idea that Whitman is a great advocate and supporter and celebrator of working people. Well, I mean, we've seen this obviously so many times already in the inscription section. I hear America singing, right? Um, we're seeing it here uh, again. You Sardinian, you Moravian, um, uh, Swabian, uh, again, Moravian, um, you Saxon, um, um, Walshian, um, Romanian, Bulgarian, you Roman, Neapolitan, you Greek, you live matador in the arena at Seville. And every once in a while, he'll do this thing where like, he just gives kind of an image, a powerful image, like you know, bullfighting in, in Seville. You mountaineer living lawlessly on the uh, Taurus in Turkey, or the, um, the Caracas, uh, that, those mountains between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. 
You bogue horse herd watching your mares and stallions feeding. So now we're, we're back to Uzbekistan again, right? You beautiful bodied Persian at high at full speed in the saddle shooting arrows to the mark. This idea that people who can ride ponies for Whitman are people who can do remarkable things, right? You Chinaman and China woman of China, you Tartar of Tartary, you women of the earth subordinated at your task. This is an interesting word, subordinated, isn't it? And then all of a sudden now we're back to a comment that we made early on. You Jew journeying in your old age through every risk to stand once on Syrian ground. And, of course, the idea of the Odyssey is forever a part of reading Leaves of Grass. I mean, we're about to turn to the great Odyssey poem, Song of the Open Road. You other Jews waiting in all lands for your Messiah. Of course, this idea of the Messiah, think about it. It is a central concept to all of our reading of Leaves of Grass. The expected one, the one that one looks forward to and obviously provides some kind of, what would we say, freedom, redemption, understanding, clearly Poet and priest Whitman is hoping for something very similar. You thoughtful Armenian pondering by some stream of the Euphrates, you peering amid the ruins of Nineveh, you ascending Mount Ararat, you foot-worn pilgrim, we'll obviously talk much about that in our Song of the Open Road discussion, you foot-worn pilgrim welcoming the faraway spectacle of the minarets of Mecca. I mean, think about how amazing it is that he's including all of these different religious and theological understandings under one large inclusive canopy. No, no question, this is a huge part of what Whitman was about. You sheiks along the stretch from Suez to Babel Mandibli, uh, Yemen, uh, between the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, ruling your families and tribes. You olive grower tending your fruit on fields of Nazareth, Damascus, or Lake Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. You Thibet um, um, trader on, um, th this is of course Tibet, on the wide inland or bargaining in the shops of Lhasa. You Japanese man or woman. You liver in Madagascar, Ceylon, Sumatra, Borneo. It's an amazing thing how he just jumps all over the globe intentionally. All you continentals of Asia, Africa, Europe, Australia, indifferent of place. He loves that word, doesn't he? Indifferent. It does not matter where you come from, in other words. All you on the numberless islands of the archipelagos of the sea. Of course, we think about the thousand islands that will constitute that area, right? And you, of centuries hence, when you listen to me, it's as if he knew, and we're going to say this as well in our study of, uh, of uh, Brooklyn Ferry, it's as if somehow Whitman knew that we would be playing this game right now with him, and there's something really kind of, I think, cosmic and cool about that as well, right? And you, each and everywhere, whom I specify not, but include just the same. Again, the inclusivity. Health to you. Goodwill to you all from me and America sent. Now, we're going to see what we sometimes scholars have called the false endings of some of the Whitman poems, where he writes these poems and it's like, okay, he's done. But then all of a sudden you go, maybe not quite yet done, right? But we're going to see some of this as well. Again, anytime he mentions America, in Leaves of Grass. It's significant because he doesn't do it that often, as we said in our study of I Hear America Singing. And then we're going to get five each as to finish passage 11 to get on to 12. Each of us, inevitable, each of us, limitless. I mean, this is pure Whitman gospel right here, right? To speak of Whitman and his new, and his new American Bible, right? Each of us, with his or her right upon the earth. Think about the power of the, de the Declaration of Independence, that document that Whitman loves so much, and of course Jefferson and his language there. Each of us allowed the eternal purports of the earth. Notice both these lines ending with the word earth. Each of us here as divinely as any is here. Notice the repetition of the word here makes it immediate, and of course we cannot help but read a, 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 a line like that and not think of Ralph Waldo Emerson, so influential in the way that Whitman is ready to think of humans as divine in some powerful way. And then we just continue it in passage 12. You uh, hot and trot. Now this word for Whitman, uh, as Norton's will remind us, is a word that really is just kind of a catch-all phrase for what um, Whitman and those of his ilk would think of as uncouth or primitive with clicking palate talking obviously about the articulation. Uh, you woolly headed hordes, again it's going to raise the question of 
of, of, of Whitman's racism. You owned persons, obviously now we're back to slaves, dropping sweat drops and uh, or, or blood drops. You human forms with the fathomless, ever-impressive countenances of brutes. And again, th this will be language that for us today is difficult to read, but as we have said from the very beginning, we're not going to shy away from Whitman's um, cultural racism. We're simply going to see it for what it is, right? Um, you poor um, Kubu, um, this again uh, over related to a Malaysian and a, Sum a Sumatra forest tribe, whom the means of the rest look down upon for all your glimmering language and spirituality. Notice, he says, others might look down on you, but I refuse to look down on you. Again, the inclusivity of, the, of, of, of Whitman's project is huge. You dwarfed um, um, Kashmikistan, um, uh, in, again, Siberia, Greenlander, Lap, you Austrian Negro, he'll use the term, naked, red, Sooty with protrusive lip. Again, this is hard, obviously, for us to read today. Groveling, seeking your food. You kafir, Berber, Sudanese. You haggard, uncouth, untutored Bedouin. Obviously, uh, Arabian nomadic tribesmen. You plague swarms in Madras, uh, India, Southeast India. Uh, Nanking, now all of a sudden we're to China. Kabul, obviously, Afghanistan. Cairo, Egypt. So notice he's just jumping all over the place. You benighted roamer, and we're going to talk a lot about this idea of roaming when we get to the Song of the Open Road, of Asmonia, you Patagonian, you Fiji men, and then he finally is ready to end passage 12 and to begin passage 13 with the pronoun I. I do not prefer others so much, so very much, before you either. In other words, after listing all of these, some of that language, in fact, racist, he will, in fact, say it. I don't consider myself superior to any of you. I, he says it this way, do not prefer others so very much before you either. I do not say one word against you, away back there where you stand, and then in parenthetics, in a very interesting prophecy, Whitman is prophet, right? You will come forward in due time to my side. Now, again, I mean, to say this thing about come forward, just think about Langston Hughes' classic poem, I Too. We've given a full lecture on that online at LearnStrong.net. Think, think about the power of Whitman as the great inclusivist. And to finish, that is, of course, one of the great two-way observations, right? Everybody for Whitman is different and yet at the same time equal. It is fundamental to understanding Whitman's view of the world and, of course, of America. And to me, we've already commented on this repetition, <laughs> right? The 78 U's, all of those exclamation points, 19 times being used, obviously echoing the title itself, right? At 3A, well, all of the religious and spiritual texts that Whitman is, is, uh, is going to reference, and obviously he loved to be a part of this, Passage to India, as we've said before, 3A. Finally, at 3B, of all of the question for us to somehow relate to, of all the places listed, right, which place do you want to visit, right? Um, and then maybe when you're there, you read this poem while you're there. For example, if you ever find your way to Sumatra, you might take along your copy of, uh, of Leaves of Grass and read it there. Maybe Sumatra the most beautiful place in the world, who is to say, right? Uh, I suppose it all just kind of depends on uh, your view of the beautiful. Sama Sama, thank you.